Right. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for the invitation to this uh, conference. Um, my talk will be about uh, a general scheme how you can construct many interesting C star algebras. So that's the point of these two point models. So, in, in the general picture of things, you might like examples of C star algebras, and you're going to see more and more of them. Uh, if you're working on classification, maybe you particularly like classifiable C star algebras, and then you know that there is only a limited amount of them. And you might want to somehow construct them all in some meaningful way from simpler data. And um, so groupoid C star algebras are a pretty, pretty powerful um, uh, method for constructing interesting C star algebras. So many C star algebras, many interesting C star algebras. So then there's kind of two parts to the statement. First of all, many examples are groupoid C star algebras. And then you can actually do something with a groupoid. If you know that your C star algebra is a groupoid C star algebra, you can, for instance, uh, decide when it is simple. You can say something about AMS states, at least for certain dynamics. You can say something about traces in particular. K0 is, well, K theory is kind of more difficult. That's the domain of the common conjecture for groupoids. And there, well, this is also now being used more and more by some people. Because there's also a method for that. Um, so it's quite useful to know whether your C star algebra is a groupoid C star algebra and then how the groupoid actually looks like. Um, okay. Um, and maybe the first example that people looked at for this were the Kunz algebras. Ron Renaud in his thesis already worked out groupoids whose C star algebra gives the Kunz algebras, and then there were Kunz Krieger algebras, and then Graph C star algebras. And um, yeah. and um, historically, I think Graph C star algebras, many results was that were first proven by writing them as Bupoid C star algebras. And these graph C star algebras have been generalized in various uh, directions by adding some adjectives to this. Uh, for instance, you could talk about topological graphs. This is something that um, Katsura did. So uh, now the vertices and edges form topological spaces, and you have some conditions about the range and source map. And you may graph C star algebra like thing out of that. Something else you could do is higher rank. So a higher rank graph means that we have kind of several graphs all put together in some rather complicated way. Um, my way of thinking about this would be um, that the graph is some kind of endomorphism. Of, a, um, of the C star algebra of functions on the vertex set. And you could have several commuting endomorphisms and make a C star algebra for that. And this gives you the higher rank situation. So it's a bit like replacing one endomorphism by several commuting endomorphisms. Something else that people have looked at more recently is um, cell similar. Um, graph C star algebras. And this came actually also from self-similar groups.
So self-similar groups is a structure which um, people study in dynamical systems because they are very interesting and powerful invariants for complex dynamical systems. And Nekashevich also attached a group voice to a self-similar group. And um, I suppose Roy Axel and I think Cardo, they noticed that if you generalize this construction by putting it together with graph C styles to get self-similar graphs C style algebras, you could um, uh, put a construction by Katsura in general context, which allowed to construct all Kirchberg algebras. So this was one of the motivations was to find group oils for. And nice models for, for let's say, all classifiable Easter algebras. And you could start with the pure infinite case of Kirchberg algebras. And then Katsura found the system with Linus Hock. And um, the excellent part of this into this self similar graph Easter algebra construction. That is now a, kind of a larger picture for this construction. Something else when I think about is algebraic dynamical systems. Algebraic dynamical system means that you have endomorphisms of a group, maybe also several of them, or just one, and you make these the algebras out of those. Um, this was done, for instance, by Kuttens and Bershik or Stammeyer. And um, the way they proceed, this is also a special kind of self similarity. So I think of the self similarity of a group also as a kind of endomorphism of a group, for which I'm then doing a construction to make for the Easter algebra. Like a cross product. So if you know cross products for endomorphisms, um, this construction generalizes for more general things than usual endomorphisms. And um, so um, all these constructions um, are actually part of a more general picture where you have the parallel groupoids, and then you have some kind of maps between the parallel groupoids, which are called groupoid correspondences. And such a group wide correspondence um, allows to construct these interesting C algebras. And today I want to talk about how this goes, some kind of commuting square. There's group wide correspondence. <laughs> And then there is um, C star correspondences. And I'm thinking of these as some kind of endomorphisms of a group point or a C star algebra. And then there's something like a cross product uh, for a group action or, or a single automorphism there as a cross product. Um, and uh, so there's a way also for, like for a Group action, there is a transformation group of, of a group action, which encodes the situation in a single groupoid, which I call the groupoid model. And if you have well, an automorphism, then you can make a cross product. I like to call it covariance alter, which is actually the original name the physicists gave to the construction when they invented it. Or you could call it Kunz-Pinsner algebra, but that's what it is for a C-star correspondence. At least if you add some adjectives to talk about that later. And in sufficiently nice cases, you have a kind of commuting square. So if you start with a groupoid correspondence, a single one that, that would work, and it has some properties, then you can first turn this into a C-star correspondence and then take it Kunz-Pinsner algebra. Of generalized cross product or covariance algebra, or you could first form some kind of transformation groupoid, which I call the groupoid model, and then take its C star algebra and you get the same result. And this would explain uh, the groupoid C star algebras for many of these cases. However, some adjectives I uh, need to impose uh, mean that for graphs, these algebras I cover only the so called regular graphs, so all vertices should be regular. That makes the groupoid model for the graph C star algebra much easier. And the general theory at the moment is mainly in this easier special case. I have a doctoral student who, well, 
should finish, should have finished already some time ago, but is still working on this, uh, writing things up, uh, who is generalizing to a single uh, kind of irregular case, so it's a single correspondence. So I kind of know how to handle this, um, but I think I won't speak about it today. Okay, um, I should now explain what all these things are, in particular what's the Buchheit correspondence, what's the C-star correspondence, might be easier because we will talk about this already in the morning, and this might also be familiar to most of the C-star algebraists here. So a C-star correspondence, Um, so you have two C-star items between which you have a C-star correspondence, and for well, it's much less confusing if you think of the right C-star algebra as a source, and the left one as the, the range of this thing. So the arrows go in kind of some sense the other way. This is also for groupoids. Somehow, if you compose groupoid arrows, and the composition works nicely if the source is. Um, on the left and the range on the right. Um, so a C-star correspondence means that you have um, the Hilbert B module. E, then you have um, you have a star homomorphism from A to B of E, which is non-degenerate. Um, the general theorem which I develop only works nicely in this non-degenerate case. This is because I would like to think of these C-star correspondences as some kind of um, uh, maps from B to A. So I should be able to compose these maps and there should be <laughs> identity arrows which compose like identities. Uh, the composition here is just tensor product. You have some C star correspondence E and another one F between different C star algebras. Then you can handle them together over B. And this would be a C star correspondence now from C to A. And this is the composition I want to put on C star correspondences. Uh, note that I don't identify isomorphic C star correspondences. I treat them as truly different. Uh, so my arrows really are supposed to be the C star correspondence itself and not its isomorphism class. Um, this is important because I have then to add isomorphisms of C star correspondences as a second uh, level of structure. These are so called two arrows. So, if these are the arrows, then there are higher arrows between arrows. There are different choices here. It doesn't really matter which one you pick. These um, could be just uh, isometric intertwiners for bimodal maps, which are also isometric for the inner product, is fine. If you restrict to unitaries, you don't lose too much. But there is sometimes a situation where you want to allow um, non-unitary isometry that's two arrows. Okay, and um, if you think about the algebraic structure that you find here, all this stuff together forms what is called the bi-category. We had one categorical talk before, which might prepare you a bit for uh, these ideas. Uh, another example of a bi-category would be categories. So you have functors and natural transformations. So you also have these, uh, the same levels of structure as here. So objects are C-star algebras and have certain arrows which would uh, categories and functors and then there is some kind of natural transformation like things. Or if you like homotopy theory, then of course there's spaces, there's continuous maps and then there might be homotopies between them or rather homotopy classes of homotopies, because if you don't, don't take homotopy classes on this level, then you need to add even more levels of structure 
Uh, homotopies of homotopies, and I don't want to go that far in a stick with bicategories. Okay, there's one important difference between uh, categories and this setting, namely, if you compose functors, it's just associative. Nothing to talk about there, but here, with this tensor product, uh, it is associative only up to very canonical isomorphisms. So if you tensor three correspondences, the result isn't quite associative. But there is an obvious way to identify the different brackets and so on. Um, similar with units, if you have a C style to by A, then you can treat it as a correspondence from its from the C style to itself, just the usual bimodal structure and the obvious inner product. And this behaves like a unit on the left and on the right for this tensor product, but this needs non-degenerate. If I allowed degenerate things, I wouldn't have unit errors, and so I would be outside this category realm. And if you really have to, maybe you do this, but I don't feel that the degenerate case is really worthwhile so much to generalize beyond by categories to something that the category theorists don't care about. So I stick with the non-degenerate case. Okay, so C star correspondences form a by category. If you have a by category, like in a category, you can do certain things like in category theory, you might want to look at diagrams and then take limits and co-limits and things like that. And if you just play around with this, for instance, you well, the first thing I noticed was if you take a group action um, and work out which universal property the uh, let's, in this setting it's the limit. So of course the limit and column depend on the direction of arrows. And uh, the way I set it up now, it's the limit that I want to look at. If you look at the universal property of the limit, you get the universal property of the cross product for the group action. That's really slightly uh, surprising. If you think about limits for group actions on spaces, then um, well, you could work this out as, as an exercise in the category theory class. You have a group action as a diagram. What is its limit? What is its co limit? And you find you get the invariance and the co-invariance for your group action as limit and co-limit. So they are both kind of smaller. And that's because for limit and co-limit, you ask for certain diagrams to commute. This gives you extra conditions. But in a by category, you have these two arrows. So diagrams only commute up to two arrows. And therefore, making a diagram commute is extra data, not extra conditions. So if you think about commuting diagrams defining the limit of a group action, you would add unitaries that identify certain arrows, uh, which means that they intertwine certain automorphisms, and so you actually get the cross-product algebra as a limit. Okay, and if you now, uh, inspired by this, look at a single C star correspondence and work out what its limit is uh, with um, well, uh, if you prove a little result, you find out that if your C star corresponds is what's called proper, meaning the left action is by compacts. So proper means A goes to compacts on E. And if you are in that case, then um, for the proper, When I say Kunst-Pimsen algebra, there is uh, one important issue. Could you say which limit of what So the correspondence uh, is an arrow from A to itself, and the diagram is generated by that. So it's the homomorphism from the natural numbers to this um, correspondence by category, which spans 
one to your given correspondence, and then we just compose. This is a kind of free category on one generator, therefore you can actually extend it to a diagram. Like the C style device might know that a Z action for the free group on one generator is just one automorphism. Similar things happen here in this mm -hmm. uh, I mean limit. Uh, N with addition as a, as a monoid. So N is a monoid. One object, um, one arrow for every natural number with addition is composable. So I send the natural number N to the N fold composite tensor over A of this correspondence. And then, in addition, the diagram also has multiplication maps. Which means that certain diagrams commute. So the uh, maps from E tensor NA tensor over A, E tensor MA going to E tensor N plus M. Um, this is also part of the diagram. Okay, so I talk about a single proper C star correspondence and um, I can view this as a diagram and um, then uh, think about what could be a limit in the bicategorical sense of it. And if you work this out, you find out that um, the universal property of this limit uh, requires that you should have an arrow from A or, um, to this limit or to some. Let's say I talk about cones over this diagram, and my arrows go from right to left. So this means I have a C star correspondence where A is on the left and D on the right. So you have a Hilbert E module with a left action of A. That's um, so the limit has an arrow from, from the limit to the diagram, which means you have one object A, and then um, I have here my endomorphism E. And I have my correspondence here. And this triangle should commute. Uh, but in a bicategory, it means there should be a unitary that makes this commute. So this unitary would be an isomorphism between E and by F going to F. Um, it's a unitary which intertwines also the left A module structure. And if you think about this unitary, you can attach to it a map from E into, uh, well, let's say, adjointable operators on F. I kind of, if you have something in E which is fixed, you can look at the creation operator and compose with that. And in the proper case, this actually works out nicely. Uh, there are some technical issues with disadvantability and things like that in general, which I don't want to talk about. Um, and when I say absolute Kunz-Timsner algebra, I mean that I really impose the Kunz-Timsner covariance condition on the whole C star algebra A, which I can. So if the left action of A is not faithful, then we learn from Katsura that we should do something a bit different and only ask this on a certain ideal. Um, but well, by category, he doesn't know about that. They just so uh, they just do it on the whole C star algebra. Um, so that is um, the limit of, of a single C star correspondence. So we see that Kunz-Timsen algebra and cross products have kind of have now been put under the same roof. They are both examples of limits of diagrams in this correspondence by category, which is a nice thing. I suppose the experts always had the intuition that this Kunz-Timsen algebra is a bit like uh, uh, a cross product or so. Um, this also goes on if you have a product system. So if you have um, now not just the natural numbers but a monoid, and look at the homomorphism from this monoid to this correspondence by category, that's the same as well an essential um, product system, essentially that you have this non-generously imposed. Um, and if you work out what the limit of this is, in the proper case, you get the Kunz-Timsner algebra of this um, product system. Okay, so this works out pretty nicely uh, on the C-star correspondence side. 
And at some point already a couple of years ago, uh, well, a doctoral student came up with the idea that if you have a groupoid, you might just lift all this to the groupoid level and make groupoid correspondences and maybe try to find something like the Confinsenhalt where right in the groupoid world, the limit down in the groupoid world, and it might be that the um, Confinsen algebra is the groupoid C star algebra of that. This is actually quite interesting because this limit construction is actually doing strange things. Um, for instance, if you think about graph C star algebra, or so the Kunz algebra, you know that they are the Confinsen algebra of this kind of um, C star correspondence. So you take the complex numbers. You take c to the n, view it as a c star correspondence over the complex numbers, nothing very interesting. If you take the kunz pimsner algebra, you will get the Kunz algebra O n out of this. Um, well, at the time my student uh, thought about this, I already knew how to lift this to groupoids. Uh, the complex numbers is the groupoid c star algebra of the 1.1 error groupoid. And c to the n is just the space with n points. That's just something like n. And uh, in this example, Cooper corresponds is not very interesting for the point. So this space with n points is exactly one way to make it a group point correspondence. And um, so somehow out of this, we want to make the underlying group point so that O n is the C star algebra of that group point. So, Renault explained how this thing looks like. We are called G N. And for instance, the object space of G N would be the infinite product of copies of this endpoint space, which is no longer discrete, it's totally disconnected. So you need some interesting. So this construction of a groupoid model would have to be very interesting to give this because we start with this discrete stuff, which looks very boring to produce this rather interesting groupoid giving you the Kunz algebra. But it actually did work out remarkably enough. So that you, have to, you have to take the topology into account. Of the hmm? You have to take the topology into account. Uh, yes. Okay. Hmm. So, so I work with topological groupoids all the time. And then somehow this limit construction produces non trivial topologies automatically. So like a product it's of, remarkable. Like the product of discrete spaces is. is yeah, yeah, something like this, yes. Um, exactly. So the topology comes in for free. Uh, which is remarkable and surprising. <laughs> okay, um, so I should probably write down the name of that student already. Uh, he finished already more, uh, more than seven years ago. Or, no, several years ago, let's put it like this. Um, uh, so we have some paper about uh, about the CSTA correspondence by category, which is kind of the project where I kind of asked him to join to get to start on some interesting projects. And then he sees this, he worked out this groupoid level thing. Um, after he finished his thesis, I kind of worked more on this construction and I tried to find a better description of this groupoid model. So he only worked with this limit universal property. Now, the thing is that a limit is unique up to equivalence. Right? Uh, or isomorphism in categories and in bicategories, it's unique up to equivalence. In the C star correspondence by category, well, it's uh, you might even have heard that the kind of equivalence you get there is Morita equivalence. And the same happens for groupoids. So this limit is only unique up to Morita equivalence, and this makes it kind of awkward to work with it and to prove results like it's C star algebra isomorphic to a certain thing because you only know this thing up to equivalence. Uh, so I want to have a property which characterizes this groupoid model uniquely up to isomorphism. Um, and so that's probably one of the points of this talk. Um, I recently also put out papers about this. So my student wrote his thesis and it's uploaded on the university server, but he didn't get down to writing journal articles about it. And um, so there's now some papers together with my student Antunes and Joanna Co and me. And another one is just by Joanna Co and me. We got a master's thesis about existence of groupoid models in general, not just for a single correspondence. So my student Alvandi only worked in kind of nice monoids. 
where things work out nicely with like higher rank graph situations. That's where you could construct a limit. Uh, and the limit, well, you had a construction for it, so it was supposed to solve the problem. Um, but it wasn't well defined up to isomorphism, so you couldn't say that you had an existing get an existence result, but non-existence results would have been kind of impossible in that well maybe. Uh, so with Joanna we verified the existence question. And there's also a long paper by myself, which is uh, even more of the uh, stuff in the C ones, but thesis is in there. Um, first, I should probably talk about this by category of group points because it's not very familiar. Those who have worked with group points probably have seen Morita equivalence, and they would know that a Morita equivalence is well, a space with two complete actions with some properties. And the group point correspondence is exactly like that, but the properties are different. And those who have worked with foliation and the deeper results about them might have even have seen how Hilsumann and Scandalist defined morphisms of groupoids uh, for certain purposes, uh, but they have a different list of properties. So what they are doing doesn't give a way of going to see star correspondences. So it is in the fine print where things get interesting. And fine print also allows non of groupoids, unfortunately. Um, so it is known that if you start with these self-similar groups, but even the most famous example of it, the Grigorchuk self-similar group, you can follow the construction and look at the group, what you get, it's not Hausdorff, unfortunately. Uh, so this is kind of embarrassing because many people working with group points restrict attention to the Hausdorff case to avoid some difficulties in non-Hausdorff case. But in these constructions, well, like with foliations also, these non hausdorff things just come up. And for the general theory, if you don't treat them as a kind of hole in your methodology, because there are certain examples you can't treat, important examples like this big group, that's similar group, which is kind of the most famous example. If the theory doesn't apply to it, then so we have to treat non hausdorff group point and so on. And I won't do it in my talk today. You have to read the papers for that to get it right. Um, so, what is groupoid for me? A groupoid, I always assume it's hard. And for today, I suppose lo locally compact. So, ital means that the range and source maps are locally homeomorphisms. And locally compact means that the object space is a locally compact space. Um, also Hausdorff. Uh, the arrow space is not required to be Hausdorff, it's just locally Hausdorff because it's locally homeomorphic to the object space. So those are my objects, they are these group points. And then a group point correspondence means that you have a space X, and on this you have actions of your two group points, V and H. Ooh. Left and right, let's say this would be an arrow from H to G. Um, from right to left always. And so what is such an action for a group point? If you have never seen them, well, if you have never seen group points, probably this talk isn't for you anyway, from this point on. Um, but in a group point, it's like a group, but you can't compose everything. So your arrows, so your elements of the group point have a source and a range. And you can only compose them if the source and the range match. And in a group point action, it's similar. You can only act if source and range match. And for this to make sense, you need to know what elements of the space X on which you want to act, what its source and range are. So there is maps from X to G0 and um, to H0 called range and source. Maybe you want to get different names for them, but somehow it gets simpler if you don't invent lots of new symbols for all these different maps. And then you just, you can multiply G with X. <laughs> this is defined if the source of G is equal to the range of X. So this exists in source of G is range of X. And similarly, if you want to look at X and H, this exists if the source of X is a range of H. And then, 
Well, you want this left action, of course, to be associative in a suitable sense, and also the left and the right action of G and H should commute. So this gives you various associativity conditions for these kind of multiplication maps that are part of your action. And then there's unit arrows in your group where they should add like identities where they act at all. And that's kind of the actually conditions for a group wide action. Well, and then there's of course some continuity conditions which I don't care about. And um, among all these groupoid actions, um, well, for a Morita equivalence, one of the conditions you want is that an action should be free and proper. And I want the H action to be free and pop proper. So this action on the right should be free and proper. And you might have come across this for group actions, and you can generalize this to even non host of group in a certain way, which I won't speak about. Um, and then there's another condition, namely the source map should be a local homeomorphism. And there is no condition on the range map whatsoever, just continuous. If now your group pointer does spaces due to group points, um, so then you have just the two spaces, G0 and H0. These actions are kind of empty stuff. The free and proper condition is automatic in that case. And there is only the condition that we have these anchor maps, range and source, and one of them is supposed to be a local homeomorphism, the other is continuous. And that's the data that Katsura uses to define topological graphs. There's also a condition I call proper, which means that this range map induces a proper map from x mod g to x mod h uh, to g0. That map should be proper. Um, so for a topological graph, this is well, a condition that ensures that if you pass to C star or to a C star correspondence, the left action is by compact operator. So it corresponds to what I call the proper C star correspondence somewhere over there. Okay. Um, for other examples, the T and H are groups. In that case, T0 H is just one point, so these anchor maps drop out. So you just have a set. X or, well, it's a space, but since S is a local homeomorphism to a point, the space has to be discrete. We just have a discrete set in which you have a free and proper action of one group, or a proper and empty, should have the free action. And then you have another action without any conditions on the other side. And if you think about it, so if you have, well, let's say G and H are the same group because uh, we want endomorphisms to make these nice constructions. Like in topological graphs, we have one vertex set and edges between vertices of the same type. For a correspondence, you could have two different spaces. So you could have kind of a way of, well, like a graph where the edges have, have range and source in different spaces. We don't want that. So we want endomorphisms. And if these are a group, then it follows that x has to be just the group G times some set A which is just a fundamental domain for this free action on this set. Um, maybe one A cross G, because um, then they can highlight that the right G action is just the obvious one by right multiplication. And then you have some left action on this product set. If you think about it, it induces an action on the orbit space, which is A. So there's an action of G on A. Uh, but this action doesn't quite determine your um, left action. There's also some kind of co-cycle data. <laughs> so the rule for the left action of G on A comma something, this would be that there's an action of G on, on A, and then there is some kind of G at A which is multiplied with H. So G at A is some other group element which is produced from G and A. And now we have some, we have to work out what you need for, for this action on on the set capital A and for this construction. So that this defines the left action of G on this set. And you find the condition that people for working with self similar groups have worked with all the time. So it just comes out like that. Uh, so a self-similar group would be an example of this construction. Um, by the way, 
when if you care about algebraic dynamical systems, if you have um, a group endomorphism, which is injective, then what you could do is you define your space x to be g, and the left action on x is just the usual one, and the right action uh, uses phi, so you multiply with phi of g instead of this g. Since this is injective, this is still free, and uh, so this gives you an interesting um, uh, correspondence from a group to itself, or a self-similarity, and if you look into the paper by Stammeyer, for instance, then um, uh, he is kind of, so you can translate the construction that he is doing with these injective endomorphisms into this language, and he's just um, it's related this. This is the H and N construction. H and H and N. N construction, where you have an endomorphism mm -hmm. group injective, and you can make a new group. Um, I haven't thought about that. Yeah. Something else I have thought about is complexes of groups, yeah. uh, where, um, so um, if you think about a diagram of groups, but now in it, so there's a different way of how you can turn this in, you can turn any endomorphism, not just injective, into a correspondence by switching left and right here. So the right action is the obvious one, the left action is given by the endomorphism, and then this is uh, a correspondence which has the extra property that this map from x mod h to g0 is even homomorphisms. And um, in the group case, those are exactly endomorphisms. But now these form a bi category where it turns out the two arrows are conjugation with elements. And you get complexes of groups as diagrams. And there is a certain link between the fundamental group of this complex of groups and the group work model. But it's slightly complicated, and I don't want to talk about it. Absolutely. The thing is, I'm working with group points, and yeah. my group points have no reason to be again equivalent to a group. Um, but if this category is kind of connected in a certain way, this happens. And what you have to do is you have to enlarge your diagram by adding a trivial group and some arrows, and then it works out a bit like that. Yeah. And I don't know what this means, so maybe. Understand the HNN extension is the fundamental group of the mapping tools of BG, so this is certainly related. Could well be, yes, but um, not for this talk. But, um, but one other question is important. Um, the group is not equivalent to a group, this is due to the topology on your group board. Um, no, it's just, it's a discrete. Um, well, it's a discrete, no. If the um, group is connected, it should if be. If you, um, Actually, if you work in this case where this map is a homeomorphism, yeah. the groupoid model has the same object space as your groupoid you started with, which is just one point. So it's uh, at the moment. Ah, this is if you have a monoid. If you have a category, then it's a distant union of all the groupoids involved in the diagram. So you can work out what happens there. And so you get a discrete groupoid in that case. Mm -hmm. And in the discrete case, it's easy enough to work out when this is equal to a group with just connectedness. And which book this is also easy to work out. Um, but I don't talk about this case today. Uh, let's get back to what I um, self similar groups and algebraic dynamical systems. Um, so there is constructions of C styles in that case, which are also examples of self similar groups in algebras. Or rather, if you have just a single endomorphism, because the self similar group people never do higher rank. There, uh, a single uh, self similarity is already complicated enough. Uh, they don't go beyond that and look at more than one um, self similarity so far. Okay, um, so those are groupoid correspondences. So it's a space with two actions with some adjectives. And you see that if you look at spaces or groups, you get interesting things. And if you then are a bit more daring and look at, for instance, a transformation group where you have a discrete set D, on this you have an action of a discrete group, <coughs> you would get self similar graphs as defined by Axel and Cardo, or almost. There's one condition which was later removed in paper by, I think, Marcelo Laka and I think Whitaker and some, some others. So they found out that one condition that Axel and Pardo imposed because they were thinking of graph automorphisms isn't needed at all. And in this approach, it doesn't appear at all. So it wouldn't Think of imposing this condition. So the thing is that 
You have an edge set in which you also have a gamma action, uh, but the range and source maps from edges to vertices don't have to be gamma equivariant. There are some conditions that it satisfy, but they're not exactly equivalent. Okay, um, so we get the data people use when they look at topological graphs in style algebras or self-similar graphs in style algebras. A higher rank case would come in if you look at more complicated diagrams, so you have a monoid, or more from a monoid to the spy category. But I think I won't talk about that for many reasons. Okay, now I want to encode all this in a single groupoid called the groupoid model. And the way I specify a groupoid is also be interesting, namely I specify groupoids by its actions on spaces. It is possible. So um, um, if you have two groupoids, and if you have a way of turning an action of one into an action of the other on the same space, in such a way that it's natural in both ways, so the equivalent maps are the same for both groupoids, then these groupoids have to be isomorphic. Okay, that's not very deep, but it's, uh, it tells you that if you know how a groupoid acts on spaces, you know that groupoid. So to specify my kind of uh, transformation groupoid for a single groupoid correspondence, I have to just say how this uh, would be groupoid should act on spaces. And so I have to specify how my groupoid correspondence acts on the space. So I now fix a group P, and let's say I take an endomorphism, I think. I don't think P as well, but for that, I think you have to read the paper. Um, and then uh, the question is, how does this act? On the space Y. And um, well, first of all, the groupoid G should act on Y. Well, let's start the diagram and we know how groupoids act on spaces. So, of course, I want an action of G on Y. I used this annotation in the previous talk for actions now on spaces. Um, and then my X, well, um, it turns out that I want a map from x times y to y, some kind of multiplication map again. But it's only defined if source and range map match. So this action also has an anchor map uh, to g0 and so has x. So I want to be able to define some kind of x times y if the source of x is the range of y. And this map has a certain number of properties. Um, <coughs> There is this composition of groupoid correspondence that I haven't talked about. This is also a bi-category. So the composition of groupoid correspondence starts with this space, and then it divides out a G action, where you just say that X or, or a relation, where you say that X G Y is equivalent to X comma G Y. So this is actually the orbit space for some kind of inner conjugation action on this fiber product here. And the orbit space is like how we define the composition. And this map should factor over this relation. So you want x times y times y. Not surprising to ask for this relation. Of course, also uh, g acts, and you also want something like g times x times y. That's what this should be. Um, so there are relations a bit like this. And then furthermore, uh, you want this, um, you want the induced map if you divide out this um, G action. Uh, this map should be a homeomorphism. And um, so um, that's all. So for a single group by correspondence, an action that we have an action of the group by and such a map or even just this homeomorphism like this here, from this specific space to y. And equivariant, so that this should be a category because we need equivariant maps to specify things there, obvious conditions for these structure maps. And then it turns out that there exists a unique groupoid whose actions are exactly these. The way to do this is using inverse semi-group techniques. So my groupoid is R. <coughs> 
meaning we have slices. So these are subsets where range and source are injective, open subsets of that. And there's also a concept of what a slice inside X should be. And it turns out that if you have such a homeomorphism like this, then a slice in X, in X also acts on Y by a partial homeomorphism. And then you get lots of partial homeomorphisms, and out of this you can get an inverse semi-group action. Um, what is more, um, there is some canonical maps built into this, um, for which I need more space. Um, so remember that this viewpoint model should have interesting objects. And for instance, even this trivial boring case, you have to somehow produce interesting topological space out of nothing. How does this go? And the way it comes out is that if you have such an action, you produce some canonical maps. And these canonical maps, uh, well, you can take a limit and then get a map to a kind of a product space. Or it's actually an inverse limit in general. So if I'm starting in Y, I can of course go to G0. But I could identify Y with this. Well, I write now that something like X circle Y. Uh, this is this composition, this orbit space of the kind of product here, right? X circle Y. And this construction is kind of natural for the map from Y to the point where you go to X mod G. So if you take X circle the point, this trivial action, you just get X mod G. Oops. And there's only a morphism going both ways, or to go with this way. It's only a morphism matter. And there's a canonical map here from X mod G to G0, and this commutes. And I could go on. Um, this circle thing is kind of associative. I don't have to draw any parentheses for that reason. So I have homeomorphisms like this. And here I could now go to x circle x mod g. And well, it goes on. Um, so there is this kind of um, diagram of all these, uh, where you take the n-fold composite of x with itself, which is a group of correspondence from g to itself. So it carries a free and proper right g action, which has a nice Hausdorff orbit space, Hausdorff locally compact. In the proper case, which I want to look at, all these maps are proper. It's very good for having a, a, a locally compact inverse limit. And the inverse limit of this diagram is the object space of my point model. <laughs> Yes, but maybe just to ask later on, I mean, so you said, I mean, you want, you have this cobalt correspondence with the view of the morphism or endomorphism of the cobalt in the yes. spy category. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to tell us is to construct a preferred model of mm -hmm. the equivalent class of the limit? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm constructing our specific limit, and I'm doing it by describing its actions on spaces. And then, the limit. and then um, this limit is supposed to be a groupoid, so first it has an object space. The object space is, well, if you think about groupoid actions, then its object space carries its, uh, it has a canonical action, and this is the terminal object in the category of actions. So it's a kind of universal action of the groupoid, and therefore, since there should be an, a category equivalence, the object space of my groupoid model has to be a universal action in the sense I defined over there. And you can work out what the universal action is. On this inverse limit space, there is a kind of canonical action of my diagram. The groupoid G acts on all these spaces, and these projections are all G equivariant. That gives you the G action that's part of this action. And then if you take certain with X, you kind of just increase the number of factors here, so there's some kind of shift map, and some canonical way how you can map x circle omega to omega, where you need to know something about limits, commuting these things, but it works out all right here. Everything is it hard, nothing good. So um, x circle omega is again homeomorphic to omega, because on the end of the diagram, we have shift indices, and um, well, there's some technical support topology which works out all right. 
And all these based on top are homeomorphic, so y is everything is just y, and so you have lots of map from y to all these things, and therefore you can combine it to a map from y to omega. And that turns out to be the unique map to omega, so this is universal. And then I talk about these slices. They give you some partial homeomorphisms. They have also an omega because this is an example of an action. And if you then take the kind of germ groupoid in the correct sense, so germs a la Excel, not a la Renault, then this will give you a model for this. This has the right actions I specified. And it turns out that this is a limit in this groupoid by category. So that's worked out in my single author paper about these diagrams of correspondences. And then the, uh, the main result about this would be that if you now start with a single groupoid correspondence, make out of this this groupoid model and take its C-star algebra, uh, you get the um, absolute Konspinsner algebra of the C-star correspondence you get from this groupoid correspondence. I haven't talked about that. If you have a group of correspondence like this, um, well, you can look at the way how um, equivalence gives rise to a C-star algebra, uh, equivalence between the group of C-star algebras. So you can write down a formula for left and right action and for inner product. And these formulas work perfectly nicely if you have, if you only have the conditions I imposed here. The uh, conditions I here are enough to write down uh, the structure of this Morita equivalence, of course, it won't be the equivalence model, it just be a C star correspondence. And so then you can walk around this square the other way and you get the same C star algebra in the end. Um, all this only works for proper correspondences. In the non proper case, well, this construction can't work nicely because the inverse limit won't be locally compact. Uh, you have to do something else. There, you should think about relative conditions in algebras where you specify an idea, which in the groupoid world means you specify an open invariant subset of G0. And then properness is only asked on this subset. And then you modify this definition of an action slightly by not asking, it's not your homeomorphism, but only an open injective map whose image contains a certain subset. You get from your chosen open variant subset. And if you fiddle around with setup correctly, then you get the relative construction algebra for the appropriate subset you have chosen out in the end. That's what my doctoral student says on Tunis is working out in his thesis. He completed this summer. And I suppose I should leave you some time for questions, so I might just as well stop now.